So thank you very much for the introduction. Yes, I'm um, uh, uh, both a, an IT professional and a past practitioner in performing arts. So uh, the combination of uh, these two things work sort of quite nicely in the theme of this presentation. Uh, so my presentation today reflects some of the research that I'm doing for my PhD and fits best into the reuse of cultural content and the way that a user might enrich existing sources through creative activities. To do this, I'm going to use a recent production from the West End called The Nether as a case study and link this to digital culture and relevant theory. Uh, I hope to highlight how identity ethics and online security are investigated using ideas drawn from digital culture and applied to live theatre practice. Uh, I'll draw conclusions that the virtual environment can have real consequences and that a potentially, potentially endless existence online might be subordinate to that of a transient existence in live performance. Good. Uh, this will give you a bit of an idea of uh, the production of the nether um, and uh, hopefully while I'm talking through the, the topic. The topic of digital culture and live theatre practice has much in common with the work the keynote speaker last year, Matthew Corsi, who is one of the key theorists in this area. He set the challenge that the uniquely performative qualities of a virtual environment should aid the construction of live performance. And he asked how live theatre might learn from virtual reality, known as VR. Causey described the most effective element of VR as its ability to immerse a subject using oral, scopic and tactile senses. This appears to be an important aspect of digital arts that influenced the theoretical and practical development of the concept of what Causey refers to as a constructed virtual consciousness. The nether in the play is a virtual realm in a near dystopian future which, within which a master programmer has created an environment called the hideaway, which provides total sensory immersion. The nether itself is used for education, entertainment and business, while the hideaway is a commercial venture within the realm. Just log in to the hideaway choose an identity and indulge your every whim. When a young detective uncovers the disturbing brand of entertainment indulged in at the hideaway, she triggers a dark battle between technology and human desire. The Nether is both crime drama and a sci-fi thriller that explores the consequences of living out our private dreams. Jennifer Haley, the author of The Nether, in interviews stated that while she did not actually like the procedural crime genres such as CSI on TV, she wanted to create one for the stage, as she was interested in both VR and gaming. She wished to explore the darker, more difficult uses of the internet, where there are real questions regarding ethics, morality and criminality. She wanted to do this using the anonymity she had found in her own virtual experience and explore the environment without consequences. In order to do this, as with actual games, there are situations and as with acting games, there, are si there is a situation and some constraints. The real world is grey. Nature has all been but destroyed and lacks any sensation. The hideaway in the, in, the, in the nether, on the other hand, is beautiful, a delight of nature, set in the Victorian era and literally sensational. The smell of the woodland, the feel of the wind in your face and the taste of long unavailable drinks on your tongue. In the hideaway, no one must know your identity. You must act and speak as though in the Victorian era, and you should partake of that which we offer here, as Papa stated. Would you like to start with the axe, Mr Woodnut? asks Iris, as this stops the guests becoming too close, which will upset the balance of the hideaway. Haley's characters in the nether, as their real-world persona, are Morris, a detective, Sims, the master programmer, and Doyle, an elderly science teacher. In the virtual world, they have avatars referred to Woodnut, Papa, and a little girl called Iris. You won't be tested on this, so it's okay. I will, I will keep uh, popping these names up. Anonymity on the internet is widespread. Even when we wish to be known, we work behind a user ID, email address, and belong to a domain that does not relate to our physical presence. When people do not wish to be known, as in the case of criminal activity, dealing drugs or the use of pornography, then an alias can be created pretty easily. In the play, this is raised as an issue when Sim says to Morris on several occasions during the interrogation, you shouldn't even know me. I have the right to remain anonymous. And towards the end of the play, Sims repeats, 
We have the right to remain anonymous. It is unethical of you to reveal her identity to me, as Morris reveals Cedric Doyle's identity as the little girl. This one point raises the question of identity on the internet, played out through a theatrical production. A clever device used by Haley. Once we have actually met all three characters in the play, but we don't yet quite know who each one really is in the hideaway, we are kept in the same state of suspense as the characters in the play, with the exception of Morris, the detective who is deliberately hiding her identity because she was working undercover and because of the shame of her actions while in the hideaway. Online identity is easy to create, but the trick is to create an authentic identity. A feature of the virtual world, Causey claims, is that of creating a feeling of authentic authenticity. The feeling may be real, but the authenticity may itself be an illusion. This is expanded upon by Yvonne Dukes when she describes identity theft uh, on the internet, exposing how relatively poor data on its own will not create an authentic identity, but a relatively high integrity identity can, can be constructed by accumulating a collection of low integrity evidence. To support my case, I ask you to look at the illustra illustration created by Peter Steiner. It's quite an old one, uh, but it's sort of relevant, and I'm sure you've all seen it. In this 20-year-old throwaway <laughs> cartoon, Steiner highlights the idea that you can be active on the internet, yet invisible to others, what I sometimes call the pajama workers. Invisibility endows the user with a feeling of invincibility, and therefore a lack of consequence in a socially stable and moral person, accepted, accepted behaviours will provide the boundaries within, one, uh, within which one operates. In live theatre, we create an illusion of identity, a representation, but the audience suspends disbelief in the full knowledge that they are watching one person playing another. It becomes safe to consume in this manner. In the play The Never, back in the hideaway, Papa, AKA Sims, the master programmer, asks Iris, AKA Doyle, I told you I'll keep you posted on this, the 65 year old science teacher, what is the most important thing we offer? And answers himself, saying, an opportunity to live outside of consequence. Papa continues that nothing here can change, which is a beautiful reflection of the way we are changeless. Not only does Papa confirm the purpose of the hideaway, that the anonymous customers can act out their fantasies with impunity, but also that the environment and avatars are constant. Morris points out that there are real consequences to his actions. All access to the nether may be removed. The location of his server must be revealed, and the emotional fate of Doyle is still to be determined. While immoral and unethical, no criminal charges will be brought against Sims, as no illegal activity has actually occurred. The issue of constancy online is in direct opposition to the inconstancy and continual change in the real world referred to as liveness in performance theory. Liveness has a taxonomy developed by a number of theorists to include the ideas, uh, which includes the ideas of intimacy and immediacy being co-temporal, co-spatial, online liveness, internet-enabled social liveness, and mobile-enabled enabled group liveness. The theorist Philip Auslander uses the terms passive, interactive, participatory, translocational, and transmedial when he discusses liveness, while Steve Dixon helpfully puts his taxonomy in a diagrammatic form. This is a useful aid to aid uh, labeling the forms of performances and demonstrates a progression from the uniquely live in what he terms traditional theatre, to a range of intermediate performance types. Therefore, cyber-adapted theatre, such as the nether, and traditional theatre might sit together in Dixon's chart, while digitally-aided, digitally-assisted, multimedia and digitally-enhanced theatre might all sit together as forms of intermediate theatre. Causey reviews the question of liveness in theatre, citing Herb Blau, who wrote that there is nothing more illusory in performance than the illusion of the unmediated. Causey refers to this as disappearance, while co-present and co-temporal and transient, disappearing after execution and remaining only in memory, while mediatized and recorded, remains immortalized and never forgotten. Causey assesses that the critical essence of performance 
is its disappearance, which resists the technology of reproduction. The key features of digital culture are the change in the identity of the human subject and the immersive and interactive nature of the digital world. I also add its capacity to be remedi remediated and reused in further creative forms. During interrogation, Woodnut the detective refers to her experience in the hideaway as Woodnut and says, I lift the axe and do it again and again, and I want her to stop coming, but now it's not just my hands covered in blood, it's my face, it's my body, I can taste it in my mouth. It's so exquisite, I'm crying. I have never felt so much with every nerve, but there are no consequences. There has been no meaning between her and myself, between myself and myself, and if there has been no meaning, then I am a monster. The title The Nether is interesting as it simultaneously refers to an underground, as in the Netherlands, perhaps a type of hell, uh, to our nether regions, or to the dark web known as Tor. I can only conjecture, as Jennifer Haley has not discussed this point, however, all of these appear pretty negative and in no way utopian. The utopian proposition that technology and reuse of cultural content will resolve all known problems can also be challenged. The argument and application of technology, technological determinism and naive utopianism are not new, and the questions should really be raised at each new technological juncture. Technological determinism, according to Smith and Marx in Does Technology Drive History? The Dilemma of Technological Determinism, can be defined as technology's power to be a crucial agent of change. In simple terms, technological determinism suggests that because a technologi technology has become available, then change will happen. However, just because a technology exists doesn't mean it will necessarily make something specific occur. Naive utopianism, on the other hand, with respect to reuse of cultural content and digital technology, also referred to as cyber utopianism or techno utopianism, is the ideology that in the future a utopia will exist where the well-being of society will be enabled by technology. Richard Stiver in The Illusion of Freedom and Equality argues that there are elements of freedom and equality on the internet, but this is illusory. Stivers argues that the myth of technological utopianism is all about the power of the consumer and the special interest group. However, the power to control the internet is exclusively in governmental hands. The point about the nether is that it is a place of otherness. It is within our ability to grasp what it is, but recognize that it does not exist in our own experience. Morris even recognizes herself as a monster in the nether, a creature of otherness. This is using the concept of an advanced virtual environment as a device to distance, or, as Brecht would say, alienate the audience such, the, such that the audience was hindered from simply identifying itself with the characters in the play. Acceptance or rejection of their actions and utterances was meant to take place on a conscious plane, instead of, as hitherto, in the audience's subconscious. Taking in sequence, but in a broken timeline, Morris, a detective, and Sims, the master programmer, have an interesting exchange regarding their differing attitudes to the reuse of cultural content and what might loosely be described as creative activities. During interrogation, Sims shouts angrily at Morris, what are you afraid of, violence, porn? Did you know porn drives technology? The first photographs, porn. The first movies, porn. The most popular content when the nether was called the internet, porn. Disturbingly, it's actually true, and we all probably benefit from the early adoption of technology by the porn industry, as they were the first to develop secure online payments using credit cards. And sessions, uh, a bit disturbingly, such as these, which may be live webcast, was first developed for the online porn industry. The moral and ethical problem is eloquently stated by Morris in response to Sim's attitude, and reflects a comment made last year by Matthew Corsi, in the seminar. After the detective's experience as Woodnut in the hideaway, and in reference to the fact that Iris is always the same image of a little girl, no matter who is actually behind her, Morris says to Sims, I don't know who the first little girl was or what you did to her, but using her image re-victimizes her over and over again. 
And he continues, images, ideas, create reality, and you have created a culture of legitimization. The concept of otherness, otherworldliness in the digital environment shows strength in its immersive properties and its ability to stimulate the visual and oral senses. Users do not need to share at the same place or time. It is the otherness which allows us to explore our own nature at a distance which is a feature common to both the digital and the live. The digital, by its nature, is a medium of duplication, one which can be easily reproduced and remediated. In that way, it, it has an existence which is potentially infinite and unforgetting. What it lacks in corporeality, it makes up for in repeatability. And for those who did not choose to be re remediated, it can be an unforgiving, real experience. The live environment is co-present, co-temporal, and transient, resistive to duplication. It survives in memory only, uh, which is, by its nature, forgetful and perhaps more forgiving. It could be argued that the identity, the constructed consciousness of the individual in the digital domain, is similar to the mask worn by players in live performance. But there is a difference. The construction of the digital identity, generally, is by the self for the self, presenting the desired persona, whether for entertainment or for more dubious purposes. In live performance, the creation of a character is a simulation for the benefit of others, especially the audience. The morality of online simulation is brought into question in the nether. What is the difference between simulated warfare games and simulated fetishistic behaviour between consenting adults? Who becomes the arbiter of right or wrong in the digital world? In the live world, we already have ethical guidelines and censorship, and we are able to question morality through performance. Ultimately, we learn that there are still dilemmas with digital culture which bear exploration through live theatre, and the metaphor of digital culture and technology provide new subject matter to develop new performance material. To paraphrase Matthew Causey, I will finish by suggesting that existence in the digital culture could be one of an unforgiving, fleshless deathlessness, and that live performance might be the last refuge of forgiving forgetfulness. Thank you.